Good morning to you. This is Talk Radio Breakfast with me, Julia hartley Brewer. Thank you very much indeed for your company. Uh, let's talk right now more about Matt Hancock and uh, the uh, investigation now into security at the Department of Health. Who leaked that CCTV footage of Matt Hancock? And why on earth were there cameras in the Secretary of State's office? Dr. Alan Mendoza is Executive Director of the Henry Jackson Society and joins us. Good morning to you, Alan. Good morning, um, Julia. And, uh, there are an awful lot of cabinet ministers who are rather worried this morning. Uh, the knowledge that uh, there, there are there are cameras in uh, cabinet ministers' offices. Lots of people thought that maybe this was some sort of planted camera. Told no, it came from CCTV, um, hidden in a smoke alarm. No, you can see the camera. We've seen pictures in the Sun over the weekend showing exactly where it was, showing that footage of uh, Matt Hancock and uh, Gina Colodangelo uh, having that schmooch uh, behind his office door. But um, do we know yet where that? Uh, footage came from, how someone came by it, and why on earth the, the health secretary had a camera in his office in the first place? Well, well I think that's the first question. It does seem a little unusual um, to have a camera in your office, particularly facing the door. It seems a, just a strange place to, to put a camera. It's also, I know people have been talking about the, 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 the pictures of the camera. Um, I'd like to, you know, sort of see a contemporary picture as opposed to one from 2017, just to understand exactly what was happening. After all, why would you engage in that behaviour facing a camera, even if you thought it wasn't active in some way, shape or form? So is that random question to start with? Then, then of course, you've got how do you access such footage? And it's deeply concerning. It, it either means that a, a, you know, somebody who's working on the security side um, is capable of leaking material from the Secretary of State's office. That in itself is a problem because those people, of course, work across government departments. And if they are compromised and willing to do this um, on account of you know, selling this to the papers, then who knows if they might be willing to do it you know, for a hostile state, if they're paid enough money as well. Yeah. Um, well we don't finally, know whether we don't know whether money changed hands. I mean, I genuinely have son, of course, in the same stable as. Do, yeah. do we, I have no idea whether money changed hands or not. That certainly hasn't it's, been. Mentioned. It would seem very unusual for it not to, and we've seen evidence of these Instagram messaging apparently wanting money. So maybe it didn't change hands, but certainly there was a suggestion that money should change hands. So whether that's active, but, or but as knows, you but, say, the fact that anyone could have access yeah, to this and, it doesn't and matter the fact what it was sold on. But again, it is could have been sold to a hostile government. Uh, this would have been a resigning affair literally and uh, and that that would therefore put Matt Hancock in a situation of course where he could be blackmailed Oh, completely. So you had that aspect as well. Or, and if, if it was disgruntled staffer, the same principle applies. I mean, the question is, how did such a person get hold of the material that have had to have somehow accessed it? And secondly, again, if you've got people willing to, you know, compromise material on their ministers they don't like, again, where could that lead? It could. Uh, it's very dangerous from a national security perspective to think that ministers can no longer have, if you like, um, you know, forget this incident, but uh, conversations or see people without that leaking out. It's a big problem. Yeah, indeed. Um, do, do you think, I mean, this will go anywhere? Because there are big still issues, of course, about Matt Hancock using his Gmail account, raised by, you know, the second permanent secretary in a meeting last year. Um, but, you know, basically, he didn't use a, a Department of Health official account. As he is required to do, this was known by officials, presumably when the messages were being exchanged, known by people at number 10, everyone knew the rules. I know the rules and I don't work in government. So why was nothing done about this? There is a big security aspect here as well, isn't there? I agree. Again, you know, this is not a, um, a government uh, securitised account. It does seem utterly bizarre that he was using a Gmail account for presumably privileged uh, government business. Uh, as you say, other people knew about it. Why wasn't it stamped down upon? Why didn't yeah. someone say, what on earth are you doing? I, I don't really understand that. Um, and again, I think this highlights lax practices across uh, different departments yeah. uh, and clearly the government needs to clamp down on this straight away yeah. and again well again he's part of the government that's the trouble that it does need to be perhaps an independent person you say you literally you know it's literally should be a resigning affair if you don't obey the rules and if you've been told what the rules are and you refuse to obey them you should be out um let's talk also about pretty patel um Nisha, you've been uh, you know talking about many of these issues over the years but the pretty patel the home secretary is apparently next week going to introduce new laws to enable the government to send asylum seekers abroad for processing and uh, she's opened up talks with Denmark over sharing a centre in Africa. This is under the new Nationality and Borders Bill. It included provision to create an offshore immigration processing centre for asylum seekers for the first time. Uh, this after the arrival of more than 5,300 migrants crossing the channel in small boats just this year alone. And we're not even halfway through this year. And it's a massive increase on the year before uh, as well. Um, this has been mooted for a very long time. The predictable outcry from the, the, the obvious quarters. But is this feasible? Is this something that would work? 
Well, it's certainly feasible as long as you can find a place uh, that is willing to be the offshore um, processing centre, of course. I think it's telling that it's Denmark that's a country that's pioneered this. Denmark, you would think, you know, listeners at home are going to think this is a liberal country, a country that's known for its tolerance, it's known for its sort of open attitudes. And yet they have felt the need now to start processing migrants outside of Denmark, simply for the reason, or rather asylum seekers, I should say, simply for the reason that it's about um, trying to mitigate the pull factors. Yeah. If you are genuinely in need of asylum, if you are genuinely in need of help, and none of none of the countries are suggesting you shouldn't come. It's, it's clear that you will come, you should come. And in fact, you won't mind being in a safe place wherever it is, because the alternative is obviously death and destruction. So you'll be happy with being processed wherever it might be. But if you're a migrant who's looking to, if you like, sneak in, and then because you've gained access to a country's borders, you know that's half the battle. Mm. Well, it's a different story now. That your, your claim will have to be processed properly. You'll have to be assessed as to whether you are indeed a migrant who should be in the country or not. And you won't be doing it from the luxury of the country. You'll be doing it from a third party place that may ironically be closer to your starting point yes. than you would imagine. So yes. I think it's a genuinely a very good idea to try and uh, weed out people who, who don't go through proper processes and want to try and get into the country yeah. anyway. Bearing in mind, of course, these are nearly always young healthy men they are hardly the biggest victims uh, in the countries uh, where they, they they some either fleeing from or often claiming to be fleeing from let me ask you also about what's happening back inside this country on thursday the first of July, we have the batley and spend by election it's the third by election in quick succession a labor seat uh, of course and um, uh, lots of pressure on keir starmer of course if he loses a third by election there's talk even of a leadership challenge but there's also a lot of very big societal issues uh, at stake given that batley of course is where we had that teacher uh, who's forced to go into hiding with his wife and four young children after facing death threats simply for conducting a, a, a religious studies class where he talked about you know freedom of speech and showed uh, the cartoons that were on the front page uh, of uh, the Charlie Hebdo magazine that, that uh, apparently was seen to by Islamist extremists to justify slaughtering uh, many uh, on that uh, magazine editorial uh, uh, team. Um, he is still in hiding, still fearful for his life, um, and yet some accusations that she there's you know, this this issue just simply hasn't been an issue during uh, this by elections, completely been swept under the carpet. When surely this is a fundamental issue for our democracy. Absolutely, I mean, he's the, the epicenter of a contemporary nonsense. The fact that blasphemy laws, uh, you know, by the back door appear to be alive and well in 2021 Britain because a teacher shows a cartoon that uh, some um, extreme Muslims find to be offensive. Um, it's a complicated subject, obviously. Mm. We can't do it in a few seconds. But the reality is that if you have British school teachers being chased out of British schools by their fellow British citizens, you've got a big problem. Uh, the fact that it occurred in Batley would seem to indicate that there's a particular problem there. And why isn't this front and centre? I'd love to know what all the candidates think on this issue and whether they're prepared to defend future teachers and yeah. that teacher uh, for doing similar things for freedom of expression in this country. If they're not, we've got a big problem. Yeah, and the, the, the fact that we haven't got candidates just all mass, all just standing on one on one uh, one stage and just saying that they 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 absolutely uh, you know decry this is extraordinary, especially given uh, the beheading of Samuel Paty in Paris uh, not uh, too long ago. Thank you.